I was here last January 3rd. How many of you were here when I shared on Wednesday night? Okay, many of you. And I shared on Jeremiah 29, God's thoughts for us are for good, not for evil, to give us a future and a hope. Thankful for that scripture, because when I left here, as you were meditating on that text at home, I got rear-ended on the 10, seriously, and spent the night in Loma Linda Hospital. So when Greg asked me to come speak again, I really had to pray about it. (laughs) No, all is well. Not too bad. God's good all the time, right? All right. If it doesn't kill you, it makes you better, right? So I want to be in um, Genesis chapter 12 this evening, if you want to turn there. Speaking of that song, I Trust the Lord, we're going to be talking about faith. And I want to talk specifically about there's certain facts of faith that we need to realize. You know, we can't get away from facts. I read an interesting fact today I've never heard before. Maybe this is an old news to you. But did you, did you know that a dentist invented the electric chair? Did you know that? A dentist invented it. I wonder what was going through his head as he was working on all of his patients, right? I just want to kill him, right? <laughs> I thought that was quite interesting. A little too close to comfort right there, huh? So I want to talk about Abraham. He's known as Father Abraham. But when we find him here in Genesis 12, his name isn't Abraham. His wife's his name is not Sarah. It's Abram and Sarai. And what we see about Abraham is just incredibly important. Now, it's a monumental text because before God is going to bring the Messiah, Jesus, he was going to create a nation and bring the Messiah out of that nation, that nation of Israel. And all the descendants from Father Abraham would eventually come forth the Messiah. But Abraham, we kind of play him up as we do this a lot with biblical characters. We kind of play him up kind of bigger than they are in real life. But Abraham's just a guy with feet of clay, just like us. He had a lot of weaknesses. He had a lot of failures. But boy, did he live a big life. He didn't just live life. Life didn't just happen to him. He happened to life as he trusted God, as he lived out that song that we just sang. And so life did not mess him around, but we see in Abraham that he mastered life by living simply by faith, a life of faith. And our lives can look like this as well. Before you, you know, again, build him up in your mind, we're just like him. We're men and women with weaknesses and failures. Amen? But yet God calls us. So I'm going to look at three facts about faith. And we're going to look at the first three verses, excuse me, the first nine verses of Genesis chapter 12. And then we'll go through this, um, these, these very facts of faith that we're all called to live by faith. First of all, living by faith starts with a call. Let's read Genesis 1 through 3. And now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This is God's word. Shall we pray? God, we thank you. Uh, Lord, for your graciousness to us tonight, some of us have come in from a day of stress or worries or we're tired or maybe it's just a wonderful day filled with just all kinds of blessings we can't even count them. Whatever the case, we know that you're here with us. We're gathered in your name and you're right here with us and this is your word. So Lord, we've come to hear you speak to us and we pray that that would happen by the power of your Holy Spirit. And everyone who agreed said, amen. What made Abraham great? Number one, the first fact of faith is that the call of God was on his life. Fact number one of faith, God has called you. He's called every single one of you. 
The call of God is what makes you a Christian to start with, right? You were called out of the world into his family. You were called out of an old identity in sin into his, a new identity as his child. And this call of God to bring you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light was all a call. No one comes to the Father unless they're drawn by him. And so God was beginning that call in your life. And some of you were stubborn enough. It took years for that you to cry uncle and surrender to that God's call in your life. But the encouraging thing for us is just as Abraham was called by God, it wasn't his idea. It was God's idea. God has also called you. So all human history at this point... The first 11 chapters of Genesis had come to a dead end. Monotheism at this time was non-existent. And so Abraham, we find him here in the Ur of the Chaldees. He's standing alone. The world is spiraling down, and there's only one hope. He's the last family line. And without Abraham, humanity is at the end of the line. So God has a plan. Abraham was not a man of faith, but he was called to be a man of faith. Now, his family was in this place, um, Haran, it was was in the Ur of the Chaldees, and they worshipped the moon god. They had many gods, but his whole family, even his father's name, Terah, meant moon, meaning that they worshipped the moon god. This was very common in those days. Not being able to see God, they would worship the constellations, the weather. They would worship and believing that there was a God somewhere beyond that. So they would just cover it all and worship all these different gods. And at this time that God calls him, his wife, Sarah, is barren, or actually Sarai at this time. And he's basically saying, if you trust me, if you follow me, you're going to have children as far as the Look at the stars in the heavens. It's the sands on, on, the, on the seashore will outnumber the, your descendants. And that's a fact. See, Abraham's progress was because God's calling on his life. Not because he was some great guy and he said, boy, you've got it all together, Abram. But I'm going to, you're someone that I can work with, right? That's not God's call in your life. And I want you to be encouraged tonight. Because no one knows us better than ourselves. And the hardest thing is to sometimes, with a lot of failure or disappointment, a lot of times we can write ourselves off. But God has called you. He has called you by name. And he has a plan for your life. And the way to access that and step into that is only one way. We don't get in any cheaper than Abram. Faith. We take a step of faith. Abraham is, Abram is unqualified. He struggles. He makes mistakes. But we are not called because we are qualified. We are qualified because we are called. God qualifies the called. It's his plan. Now, we get this kind of mixed up sometimes, especially we live in a very egocentric culture, especially in America individualism runs the day. And we always think, what's God's plan for my life, right? What's God's will for my life? And we immediately think about, what does God want me to do? What is the, where does God want me to work? Where does God want me to live? Who does God want me to marry? What, you know, should I get, you know, red salsa or green salsa? What's God's will right now for these two things? What, what is God's will for me. And we tend to, in our egocentric disposition, to sort of filter through the discovery of God's will. And really, we have to twist the screws. You know, we, I remember I was working on my lawnmower uh, last year, and I had to replace the blade. And so, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey, right? So I'm trying to get this bolt off, and it is not coming off. And I'm getting extremely frustrated. And I try and loosen it hard, right? Righty, tighty, lefty, loosey. That's the way it goes. And I kept, man, I'm dyslexic. What's going on? And so I thought I'd try it the other way. And it was just the opposite. It was righty, loosey. Right? It was a reverse thread, and I didn't realize it. 
And once I understood that, that it was a completely opposite of what I thought it was, I was able to loosen up that bolt. And I think it's true for many of us. We think this is how life should be. This is the life that I think should, looks like God's will. Sometimes we'll just sit, God's da- sit, sit God down and we'll counsel him. Like, everything would be really cool if this, 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 this had worked out. What do you think, God? If you want to do these things, I'm on board. I'll follow you. But we soon to find out that God's ways are not our ways, and they're far better. God doesn't take things away from us unless he's going to do something better in its place. God does us move us someplace because he wants to do something greater in our life because this is God's economy with us, and it's all for his glory. If we're trying to pursue God's will in our own uh, desires, our personal desires, we're never going to discover it. See, God has a plan. God has a will. And he wants us to discover it and jump on board and be part of his plan. And his plan is Jesus. (laughs) His plan is to know him. His plan is to know Christ crucified. His plan for your life is to conform you into his image. His plan, his will for your life is that he would make us more loving, more gracious, more uh, uh, grateful. He'd make us more humble. He'd make us more honest. He'd, he'd conform us into the image of Christ. This is God's will for your life. Whether you, where you live, I think God's concerned with all that. He cares about all that stuff. But it is secondary when we talk about God's plan for our life. He's to conform you into his image. And he can take you from wherever you're at. Here, He is sitting in modern-day Persia, Abram is, and he is going to be called out of a land that he has known his whole life. Where is God sitting you to, where does he have you today? He takes us where we're at today. No matter what's gone on in the past, he takes us where we're at today. He says, I got a plan for your life, and right now I'm going to work that plan in you first so that flows out of you in your life. The call of God is the call of grace. God said, hey, Abram, what you doing there? Nothing. Okay, I'm going to take you out of the land that you know, and I'm just going to bless you like you can't even believe it. And Abram said, okay. That's all it is. He just said, okay. He took that first step of faith. Everything came from God. Doesn't that sound like grace? Grace, unmerited favor, God's riches at Christ's expense, all who God is, all that God has is all made available to you through Jesus Christ. It's a work of his grace. We have been saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. And we discern the will of the Lord because it's something that is imputed to you. It's given to you. Nothing you can make up not with your best efforts that you can create in your life. It's all a gift from God. Look, that's, we, we get a template of what it means, even though there's huge global implications to what's happening here between God and Abram, we get a template for our lives here personally from the call of Abraham. And it, we need to understand it was a call of grace to do his will. The call of God on your life is to realize through a total surrender of your personal will followed by a grateful acceptance of his perfect will. From our personal will to his perfect will. Each and every day, I have to do this business with God in the morning. Not my will, but your will be done. Sometimes it's, it's not so difficult. Some days it's very difficult. And I've learned for my, this is just me talking, okay? This is how I roll. I have to get that sorted out before I go out of my front door or I'm a mess. Because something, I've got something with a relationship or I've got a fear of something that's impending that I've got to deal with. I don't know what's going to happen. Or maybe something happened in the rearview mirror that is sort of lingering over. And I've got to bring myself before God and say, not my will, your will be done. This is the entry point. It's counterintuitive. 
okay, I got to go fix this and do that and call them and get this together and patch that up and take care of this and invest in that. and do this. No, it starts right there. Not my will, but thy will. And it's something, it's a miracle. It's, it's amazing what happens in the heart. And sometimes I got to work through that. I got to, I have to um, take my thoughts captive, as the scriptures say, into the obedience of Christ. Have you ever done that? Or do you, are, you, are you doing that on a regular basis? This is how we discover God's call on our life. So he says, where? He asks these questions. Where are we going to go? He says, get out of your country. And he says, where? To a land that I will show you later. Just go. Interesting. Where are we going? I'll tell you when you go. This is how God's plan is revealed to us in our life. We just have to take that first step. But I want to know what step two is, step three, step four, step five, so I can calculate the investment on this and see if, do a cost-benefit analysis and see if what I invest in this direction, there's going to be a good payoff for me in the end, right? You say, no, I want you to trust me. Take the first step. You got to take it. And then he'll give you step number two. And step number three, they're all going to follow in line like that. That's how he called Abram. We want all the steps. <laughs> and maybe perhaps you're here tonight and you're saying, I'm not really hearing God like I used to. I'm not really sensing God in my life. Maybe you didn't take that step one way back then when he said, I want you to do this. And maybe it's not so much of moving forward. Maybe you need to revisit that and say, you know, God called me to do that. I need to follow through. It could be something very simple. And what happens in this fellowship with God and hearing his voice and acting on his voice, we develop this deep intimacy with God. We learn to hear the voice of the shepherd. So we're not in charge. He's in charge. How are you going to do it? How are you going to bless me? I'm going to bring you a son. I'll show you later. You just believe. Why? Why are you going to do this? I'll show you later. Just go, you see. Like the life of Abraham is actually the true narrative of the Christian life. When we boil it down, we really look at it. It's the gospel narrative. See, the Bible is God's grand narrative. It's God's plan from Genesis to Revelation. Here's my plan. And the Old Testament is full of a bunch of little narratives, right? Abraham, uh, Joshua, Moses, David. You know, we, we see all these little narratives that are all speaking about the grand narrative. They're all building up and culminating into the ultimate narrative, and that is Jesus Christ, who's the hero of the story, right? Well, what's amazing is when Paul I wants to connect the dots between the, 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 the doctrine of justification with what's happening here with Abraham. Abraham just believed the Lord. We're going to read this in a moment. It was accounted to him as righteous. Right? He just believed in God, and God blessed him just because he can. And Abraham said, okay. So when... When God calls us, he actually takes our narrative. What's your story? When you were born, where you were born, how you grew up, what your parents were like, the heartaches that you went through in your life. You've got a story. I don't know your story. You don't know my story. But the Lord somehow in his redemptive plan can take your story, as messed up as it might be, and he can wrap it up in his grand narrative. That's the narrative of grace. Only God can do that. Isn't that beautiful? He can even take the difficult things, the mistakes, and use them in a redemptive way to help other people who are going through difficult things because you went through that. That's God's plan at work through your life. So fact number one is that to live by faith, you need to know that you are called, that you are called. So Abraham obeyed the Lord. Secondly, fact number two, second fact is living by faith comes with change. It comes with change. Let's look, keep reading here. So Abram departed 
as the Lord, in verse 4, as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And then Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. And so they came to the land of Canaan. So if you're thinking, you know, get a world map in your head, modern-day Persia. So they went to the west, right, to the land of Canaan, which is modern-day Israel, of course, and he's going to create the nation there from Abraham and his descendants. But one thing that we're sure of is that if you're going to follow me, if you're going to walk by faith, there's going to be a change in your life, Abram. There's going to be a change. And so it is for Abram, so it is for us. The call of God reshapes us, changes everything about us. We no longer make our decisions based on what is best for us, but trusting on God for what is best for us according to his will. God's call, if you live for the blessing of others, he's saying, I will bless you. God never pulls you in unless he sends you out. He doesn't pull you into his plan unless he he pulls you in so he, he can send you out. Jesus said, as you sent me, I send them, speaking of his disciples. So as Jesus was sent to redeem mankind, we've received that gift of that incredible sacrifice for us because we needed it first. I needed forgiveness first before I could proclaim forgiveness in Christ. I needed the grace of God first so I could be gracious to others. But he pulls us into that so that he can send us out as his people, as one new humanity, if you will. You know, we are Christians before you are anything else, before you're American, before you're Asian, before you're Hispanic, Caucasian, before you're a soccer player, a surfer, a golfer, a Republican, Democrat. You are a Christian before you're anything else, and we are, the way that Paul talks about it in Ephesians, is that we are actually like one new humanity. We're a new people. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, or female nor or male. We're all on an equal level together as recipients of the grace of God. What a change. He's created us for change. What if I had to say right now, we are going to do something that we have never done before. What are you thinking? Some of you are going, oh, no, let's not do it. Because you're resistant to change. Some of you are going, yeah, what is it? I want to try something new. See, we react differently to change, you see. But there will always be a change. God always will pull us out of our comfort zone. So see, he's pulling Abram out of his comfort zone in order to, um, to realize and to apprehend that blessing that he has for him. So... What is motion? Isaac Newton's first law of motion, a body at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by an external force. Now, isn't that true? Honey, go mow the lawn. Uh, Boom. External force comes in there, right? Abram, I'm called you to external force. And it was actually in Abram's case, it was God's grace. It was the compelling grace of God. Change actually is the fundamental word for the Christian. Think about that. We are called into a change, a change the way of our thinking, a change in how we see God, a change in our lifestyle. Change is deeply integrated into what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. There will be change. You know, my kids, when they were in their, we call them the wonder years. Yeah, you know, like three through Three through 12, those are the wonder years. Now, we didn't want them to grow up. But then, once they're 30, we want to see some changes in their life, okay? And so there ultimately has to be some changes. They took a poll asking retirees about what is the one thing that you regret over your lifetime or what is the one thing you would have done differently in your lifetime. You know, the overwhelming answer was, I would have taken more risks, 
Interesting. Because we like our comfort zones. We like our security blankets. And Abram's being called out. One thing that is a fact of faith is that there will be change. The only one that doesn't have to change is God. The immutability of God. God changes not. I am the Lord. I do not change. Malachi 3.6. He doesn't have a need for change. And so he calls us to himself. And he just remains the same. But we shape, our lives are shaped around him. Shaped with our time with God. Shaped in the scriptures. Shaped when we're fellowshipping with one another. We're in a constant change in our life. And the moment we stop changing, we're in real trouble. We need to change each and every day and be open to change in our life. Change of our lives, changes our, of our motives. And yes, sometimes even a change of something external. Where, uh, what you're going to do with your life as God is calling you to step out by faith. See, even smart businesses know that only difference between rut and a grave is depth. <laughs> Are you in a rut? you feel like you're in a rut God's called you and in that calling there is going to be some change now you find in life that your favorite flavor is not always on the menu (laughs) because it's not what God is choosing for you today you have a favorite restaurant right you go there all the time. You know what you're going to get. Maybe you're thinking about it right now, right? When this guy gets done preaching, he's going kind of long. We're going to the restaurant. I know exactly what I'm going to order. You go to that famous restaurant, and you show up, and you, tell, you bring your friends, and you go, oh, they have the best, da-da-da, and they have a different menu. Oh, no. The scandal. What's, it says these, everything's new on here. Now, our reaction to change is first, it's fight or flight, Right? Fight or flight, the change. Okay, I'm going to fight it. What is going on? You slam your menu down. Why would you change the menu? Or flight, we're out of here. We're going to the other favorite place. That's usually how we, what we, how we deal with change. We either fight against it or we get ourselves out of the situation. But there's a third way to handle it. And we see in Abraham, faith. Maybe it's going to be better. Why don't I give it a chance? Maybe, why am I fighting or am I flighting against this change that needs to take place? Faith is the answer. God, what are you going to do today? Lord, what do you have in store today? What's going to happen in this situation? I I know it looks horrible. I know know everyone's really nervous about what's going to take place, but... I'm excited to see what you're going to do because we're going to give this to you. We're going to see what you're going to do in this person's life. We're going to see what you're going to do in this situation. I know it's kind of messed everything up of how we thought things should be, but God, you have a plan. And we enter it and we respond to it by faith. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8 says, The end of a thing is better than its beginning. The patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. See, we tend to think that if the beginning is bad, then the end must be worse. (laughs) We're not trusting God in that. We don't understand God's economy. Actually, what God has, we see this even in, remember the first miracle? Jesus turned the water into the wine. It wasn't, they're like, you know, at a wedding, they'd bring out the good wine at first, and then after the party's gone for a while, they bring out the shackleberry punch right after that when everyone, and they're saying, oh, he saved the best wine for the end, which I believe that first miracle is prophetic of what J- Jesus came to bring in his kingdom. He saves the best for last. He, we, he, it's this whole concept of God's economy that if we trust him, things will get better and better. Paul describes that we go from glory to glory. These bodies might be winding down, but my spirit is just growing from glory to glory. 
And you can't exhaust the love of God. It's like the bottomless sea, and you're discovering new aspects of God's love and God's grace. Oh, wow, I've been a believer for 60 years, and I've never seen this before. It's amazing. You can't exhaust the nature of God and the love of God. That's God's character. That's, that's God's economy. Abe had to leave what was familiar. And change is terrifying for most people. Because, let's face it, we like to have our life rafts. If everything falls apart, at least I have this. And it's different for different people, okay? Your life raft or your security blanket is, may be different than it is for me. So some guy, he's married, and... The wife says, I'm out of here. Now, he says, at least I have a job, right? Some other guy might say, oh, I lost my job. Oh, at least I have a wife that loves me. Maybe for each and every, their security blanket was their income and the money that they brought in. Boy, they could handle anything. I, I just couldn't handle being broke. Or... I don't care if I have a lot of money, but more, boy, if this person wasn't in my life, I don't know what I would do with my life. And we tend to do that. We tend to take things that are in and of themselves, they're not bad. They're good things. They can be even real blessings of God. But we make them our security blankets and sometimes even above God. So when he does call us, we can't let go of that security blanket. You want to know something? Why we're so scared about certain things? Because under each of our fears is are those the loss of those security blankets. If you want to know what your idols are, here Abraham was in a land of idols, and God was calling him out of a land of idols, and he was going to be the one and only God, Yahweh, in his life. One God. And if I when I look to what I What are the idols in my life? I follow my fears. What would life look like without that? Maybe I put too much stock in this. It's not a bad thing. I'm not discounting it, but is it is it keeping me from truly following God? Is it keeping me not only that, but keeping me by by being fully satisfied in God? Because that's what He's after in us. That's what He's called us to, that we would be just satisfied in any context that we find find ourselves in, in any circumstance that we might be in, that we'd be satisfied in him and confident in him. And that leads me to our last point here. So living by faith is that there's a fact number one, there's a call on your life. Fact number two, that it's change is going to be included in this call of God. And fact number three, living by faith should be filled with confidence. Confidence. Let's continue on in the text. Verse six, Abraham passed through the land of the place called Shechem, as far as the terebinth tree of Moreh, and, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tents with Bethel at the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed, going on still towards the south. What do we see there happening in those verses as he is walking by faith? Abram built an altar. He worshipped. In verse 7, he worshipped God. Verse 8, he worshipped God, etc. Through verse 9, he's in a place of worship. And then we read there that famous verse, and he believed the Lord, and it counted to and, and he counted it, God counted it to him, Abraham, as righteousness. There's one thing to believe in the Lord, and there's another thing to believe the Lord. Do you see that subtlety there? Not just, I believe, you know, in I believe the Lord. I believe the Lord. His whole essence, I believe him. We mix up this word sometimes. Belief is just to, you know, belief is just to mentally 
ascend or to acknowledge. Okay, I believe that. Yeah, that's cool. No, to believe, the scriptural word for belief is you believe in your, God's not your crutch. He's not my crutch. Have you ever heard people say that? Oh, geez, Christianity is just your crutch. No, no, Jesus is my whole stretcher. I put my whole self on him. I, we believe in him. I, you, you give, belief is like that. You completely hand everything over to God. You, you just get your hands off of the wheel. You let him take over. You let him, and things are stirring. It, something would be wrong with you if you weren't going, oh no, what's going on? What's going on? That's totally normal because you are letting go of control of your life and you're letting God take control. And it's going to trip you out a little bit, but it is incredible. This is what God is calling us to. And it should fill us with great confidence. What a wonderful blueprint, but it speaks of our relationship with Jesus. See, Abraham's life by faith, that faith was an anchor in his life throughout the many ups and downs of his life. He believed the Lord, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. You know, this verse is mentioned throughout the New Testament because it speaks so clearly of what our relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ looks like. He believed the Lord is accounted to him as righteousness. Let's take this home with us. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we believe he became our stretcher. He forgave us of all of our sins, past, present, and future. He cast them behind his back. He's cast them as far as the east is from the west, which I'm glad it's not north to the south because there's a north pole and a south pole, right? So there's an end to those. East to the west, it means into, in, into infinity. He has taken away our sin. We are forgiven. Amen? But that's only half of the gospel. Not only is the gospel, God is saying to you through Jesus Christ, is their sins are forgiven, but that's what he's taken away. But sometimes we miss the second half. It's like two sides of the coin, right? The other side of the coin, but he has given you his righteousness. He has imputed on you his righteousness. He has taken your sin and all the righteousness that is in Christ, he's put over you. So when he sees you in Christ, he sees you perfect in the son, in his own son, Jesus Christ. You are clean. Don't try and figure it out right now. I can't figure it out, but it's declared through the word of God that his righteousness is over you. And that's how God relates to you. You know what that means? You know what kind of confidence that brings? That means that the same approval that the Son has, Jesus has with the Father, you have that same approval. When he cried out at the day of his baptism, my, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased, he is saying that over you now in Christ. So we, have, we don't have to worry about getting the approval of that person or that, or that boss or, or that I need their approval so I can feel good about myself. No, when you have the approval of the one that really matters, man, that is living. Then you stop trying to, you know, impress people and you stop worrying what people think about you. You just feel your, your identity is in Christ. The same acceptance that Jesus has with the Father, you have that same acceptance. You can enjoy that he accepts you. Not because you're a great person and you play chopsticks on the piano. He accepts you because you are in Christ. Because he accepts his son, you are in him and you have the full acceptance of God. Some of us need to hear that. You're really worried about what that person thinks about you. You're trying to get them to accept you. And it's tearing you up inside. Don't fix that. You come into the loving arms, the bosom of Abraham. You come into loving arms of God and let him hold you tight. He takes our sin, and then he lays his righteousness on you if you believe in him. That's the faith that God's called us to. 
Let the other things pass by. Take that step. Some of you may have not taken that step yet. That very first step of giving your life to Jesus Christ. And you're here and God's doing something in your heart. I'm going to give you an opportunity to throw in the towel, to cry uncle. He's, you're wrestling with him right now. And he's saying, step number one, surrender your life to me. Give me the wheel. And we're going to give you that opportunity to do that. Others of us, we've known him for years, but maybe we're stuck. We're caught in that rut. God's calling you too to take that step. He's calling you. He has a call on your life. It's going to require some change. But oh, the confidence that we will know when we are in his plan is nothing in this world can ex- compete with that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who we are at this moment in this room. In Christ that we're accepted in the beloved. But some are here tonight, Lord, that don't know that. They're here. But, Lord, you are calling them by name. And if you'd like to give your life to Jesus Christ tonight, right now, would you raise up your hand? Just raise it up in the air. And we want to pray for you. God bless you, man. It's a simple saying, yes, I want to take that step. I want it to turn my life over to Jesus. He gave his life for me. I, wanna, I want him to be my Lord. Anybody else? Okay, Father, we thank you for the ultimate new beginnings of being born again in use, being a new person. I pray, Lord, for those who raise their hands. As If you raised your hand, just say right to God. Kind of tune everybody out and say, Jesus, take my life. I believe you are the Son of God, that you died for my sin, and that you rose from the grave. And I invite you now to live inside of me, to be my Lord, to take over. Here's the wheel. Here's the reins of my life. I don't know what I'm doing. You know. Be my Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. In his name we pray. Wonderful. If you raised your hand after this service, we're going to sing a song. Maybe um, someone could help with this. We have someone, we want to buy, we have a Bible that we want to give to you. Would you, you can come find me. There's going to be a couple other pastors here up front. We'd love to meet you and talk to you a little bit more of what this faith looks like in Jesus Christ. So please do that. Don't, don't just take off. Uh, introduce yourself. We want to talk with you a little bit more of what all this means. Sound good? And the rest of us, God is good. Carry on. He loves you. He's be gracious unto you. And uh, may he give you peace. And may he bless you. And, and try and not get rear-ended on the 10 when you leave here, okay? All right. God bless you. Have a great evening.